Um, so the, the title is Performance Analysis and Benchmarking for Pi C, C, but actually this is not necessarily about all the performance analysis we did and all the large scale benchmarking. It's more like the a story about the endeavor we had when we tried to, when we thought we would like to do performance analysis for our very simple code. Um, let me try that. Still there? Yes, good. Okay. Um, so what is PySTC? Well, it's a Python code, obviously, and you can find it on the website in parallelontime.org. Um, the idea here is it implements spectral deferred corrections and pretty much all the variants out there, which I could think of, in particular, the parallel full approximation scheme in space and time that is fast. And the idea here is to have a rapid prototyping framework where you can actually try to um, try new ideas and play with it. And if you have students, just let them, uh, let them try their own ideas. And uh, it's supposed to be easy access, but I guess the main point here is test before you invest. Uh, I figured it's no use to invest two years of a postdoc to figure out that uh, STC or fast methods are actually not what you want. So the idea is here, have a code which tells you that much earlier in the, in the phase. Um, PySTC comes with quite a few variants of STC and FAST. We have quite a few examples. And, uh, well, you can rely on NumPy, which is there, uh, or you can use whatever data structure is accessible via Python. We have implemented Phoenix and Petsy and, and others, but that's the nice thing here. You can just do whatever Python allows you to do. So the main question may be, why did I do Python? Well, first of all, it's easy to learn, at least for me. Um, in contrast to many, many other things. Uh, it's easy to use, again, for me. And I guess more general, it's easy to port. Um, so you can, as long as you have a decent Python environment, which you even have on many of the large scale machines out there, um, it's actually pretty easy to get these things running. Um, at the end, I had to trade time to solution uh, versus time to simulation. So it's, it was more important for me to, uh, to get from the idea to the algorithm to simulation in contrast to the runtime of the actual simulation. So this is like the, uh, uh, the, the, the trade-off I had. Okay, so what is, what is STC and FAST about? Um, let's forget per time for a moment and let's just consider one time step and write the ODE you are interested in in a PICAR form as I've done here in the first uh, part. Um, then you end up with an integral formulation and well you see that integral so you use spectra quadrature like Gauss, Gauss Lobato, Gauss Hanau, what I, whatever you prefer. And you end up with a nonlinear system of equations for each of these UM which is the solution at the quadrature nodes TM. And uh, I can basically put that into one big nonlinear and probably pretty nasty system of equations. The key question is how do I solve that? Probably not directly, so they will have an iterative method for that. And then spectral deferred correction methods can actually be seen as a, in a sense, clever Gaussian iteration to solve this, what we call collocation or other call collocation problems for all these UM. Now this is an iterative method for one particular time step. And now if I take multiple time steps, then FAST can be seen as like multi-grid for these uh, kind of problems. We'll, we'll see what that means. So fast, by now actually eight years old, which is interesting. Uh, it takes capital L time steps, not just one, but L time steps. And I hope you can see my mouse now. Can you? Yes, I hope. Um, you can see that on, on the block diagonal, you see these, uh, these collocation problems. It's here, it's there, and it's, it's up there. And they're all there. Um, and what you now uh, do for this so-called composite collocation problem is, you in a sequential way, you would solve the first one using, for example, STC, move it forward as initial condition for the next time step, solve for the next one, move it forward, save for the next one, and so on and so on. So this capital N matrix basically just uh, uh, provides the next initial condition. Obviously, we don't want to do this sequentially, so we're going to use a linear or nonlinear multigrid uh, to solve the system iteratively, depending on what your right-hand side does. And for that, we're going to use on the fine, the expensive level, just a blockwise Jacobi with STC in the blocks. What that means is take this large system, forget about the di sub diagonal, and then you have a decoupled uh, set of equations and apply one or two STC iterations for each of them. So do an iteration here, do an iteration here, do an iteration here, and that's it. There's no coupling except for if you form the residual, but no coupling for the computation. 
Then on the course level, if you have just a two level method, you would do a blockwise Gauss-Seidel with STC in the blocks. That means do one iteration here, move it forward, do one iteration here, move it forward, and so on and so on. So that's sequential, but hopefully since I do coarsening, this is cheap. So that's the classic para real idea, but now with an iterative method within the propagator. So that is basically what FAST can be seen as if you want to consider it from an algebraic viewpoint. Okay, that's very quick. So try to forget the formulas for now. What, this is how it should look like if all runs well. You start with something, I now have four processes for four time steps. You start with some initial guess. I'm doing something on the cost level. You could start with whatever you have. Um, and then I'm going to do block Jacobi, which is more or less parallel. Then I'm going to do block gauss seidel which is sequential, block Jacobi, block gauss seidel block Jacobi, until I think I'm done which could be the residual, an error estimator, or something like that. Okay, so this is how it should look like. This is how we kind of tend to present it all the times when we talk about FAST. But you should, what you should, should notice is that these arrows which indicate communication, they cross. That's not what's going to happen on your local machine and on your supercomputing cluster. If you, uh, if you send with MPI your data here, and if you send it here, this will be serialized. So we decided for PySTC, knowing that to make it just simpler as it is and just uh, deviate a little bit from that and basically uh, do the fine and coarse communication this way. Just let me go back. So you see here, this arrows are crossing, here they're not. Now we actually just have block Jacobi and block Garcidal exchanging with each other. Okay, so that's, that's what we would expect to see from a performance analysis point of view if we look into the trace files of a PySTC run. That's what we would like to see if we run fast. Okay. Well, you can do a lot of nice things with PySTC. I just want to mention a few. Uh, this is our uh, fault tolerance playground. We played a little bit with algorithm based fault tolerance and parallel time integration. Well, you run over your time set multiple times. So if something goes wrong, you can actually detect, catch, and correct it. That's nice. Uh, I started to play with parallel STC, which is in a sense uh, parallelizing across uh, the method, not across the steps. And then you have like a two dimensional parallel in time method. So multi parallel pint, I have no idea what that is. Um, I don't want to code it by, it, to be honest. Um, the next thing is, well, we do have Petsy integration. So PySTC allows you to use Petsy's data structure and Petsy's spatial parallelization. But this is actually heavily work in progress yet. Although I kind of doubt that this is progress at the moment, but it's still ongoing work. Well, this is all uh, wrapped up in continuous integration. We have GitHub pages, you saw the link. Uh, this is uh, hooked up with Travis CI to test new incoming changes to the master branch, uh, which is testing core features of the library and is reproducing most of the paper results we have to see whether we actually improve something or broke something, which normally is the case. Okay, so the question you may ask is, well, so uh, that's what I ask, does it actually work? And so the potential questions to ask when you have a code which may have written yourself or someone else gave you, is the code actually doing what it's supposed to do? So does it, so that the very specific question would be, does it reproduce that communication scheme we just saw? A second question would be, despite all the math and all the convergence theory, is it as fast as it could be? So we can run it and then it shows you something and then you convince yourself that this is okay, but maybe it can be better. And then you want to do scaling tests on uh, spatial uh, parallelization and time parallelization and space time and space and time and time. And you may want to ask uh, yourself, how do I run and keep track of these systematic studies? So what we need or what would be nice to have is a workflow manager to submit the jobs to if you don't do Python to compile your jobs and aggregate the results at the end. Then uh, if you want to uh, do performance analysis and if you're interested in traces, you need to gather all the data during your runtime. So there has to be some subsystem which does that for you. You could do this by hand, but frankly, there are other people doing that. So you don't have to do that. Then if you have the data, you need tools to analyze and to visualize the results, see what you have and interpret it and understand it. And finally, well, you have to do that for a Python code. And that is actually not straightforward as I had to learn. So there's a commercial break here for the time being because I have to tell you what kind of uh, methods uh, or tools uh, and toolboxes I used. 
So it's two parts. One is getting the data. Uh, and for that, we used, uh, first of all, the Juke benchmarking environment, which is at the end a Python framework which, uh, where you can specify, run your jobs, monitor your jobs, get the results into, uh, into a decent format. It's supposed to be lightweight and easy to learn. I tend to doubt that a little bit. At the end, it's a Python framework and it uses XML input. So you can specify the parameters you're interested in, which could be compiler flags, input parameters, uh, job parameters, and then just let it do its job. That is pretty convenient if you know how to use it. So this is how you could set up all your uh, runs and manage them. The second one is SCORE-P, which is Scalar Performance Measurement Infrastructure for Parallel Codes. This is actually pretty advanced infrastructure. It's a suit for profiling, for tracing, and for an online analysis. It is by itself highly scalable, which is good if you want to trace a highly scalable code, then that the subsystem should be scalable as well. And there's a catch here, it is used best with developers. So you may want to ask them how to do that. The good thing is the newest version actually has Python bindings. So you can basically just change your job script so that it will use score P bindings and that it will actually generate the trace files for you. So this is how to get the data. The second part is how to analyze the data. And there are basically two ways to do that. One is the manual way, and the other one is the automatic way. And both do have their uh, uh, advantages. For the manual trace view of use Vampire or Vampire, which is the German project, um, you can actually look into the full application workflow. It just shows you what the application does, and you will see an example of how that works. And it just takes the data score P puts out, and uh, you can load it in and see what your application does, how it communicates, how much it communicates, what it does and when. But maybe your data is pretty large and you just don't want to browse it by yourself, then there is something called Scalasca for you, which is an automatic analyzer of the trace files. So it can look for things like late sender or um, missing wait statements or lost messages and all these things. Or it can look for inefficient behavior and more or less automatically suggest what to do about this. Okay, we kind of used all of them, but at the end, well, it's not straightforward to do that. Okay, that's the end of my uh, commercial break. So let's see what we did. Uh, we had 2D Allen Kahn equation, which is a reaction diffusion model. Uh, it has a pretty simple setup, which is a shrinking circle problem. So you see all these yellowish dots here, they tend to shrink and you can measure how fast they shrink and you can compare that with experience to convince yourself that you're actually doing the right thing. Use an IMAX time sweeper. There's an ongoing discussion on what time stepper is right for Allen Kahn equations. We chose that one. And we use a spectral method for solving the linear part and for using interpolation restriction within FAST. Okay. So the first thing I used to do is a scalability test. So I run this in our Jurika cluster, which is a more or less general purpose uh, machine. And I used jump, a jupe, sorry, for managing these runs. So I just set up the jupe files and then let it run. And then I had to write Python scripts to get the data in a decent way. So what you see is this blue curve, that's the spatial scaling. And it actually is pretty bad because the uh, setup is rather small. So FFT won't scale pretty nicely here. But then the classical way you would do in our community is you would add parallel time integration, which is the red curve. So you take, uh, what is that, 16, uh, that's, that's 24 cores actually, so that's one node of Jurika, and uh, add parallel time integration, you see the red curve actually drives your time to solution further down than using spatial scaling only. Okay, so far so good. The question is, is that good? Is that great? Can you do better? Is that the end of it or not? Okay, so. I did trace files with score P and then I loaded up Vampire and looked at it. And as you can see, I didn't see anything. That's basically what you get. That's very colorful and a lot of numbers and stuff. Okay, this is when I had to call the developers and say, what? Okay, so here's the thing. Um, you see on the top, basically what your application does, that doesn't help me either. Um, you see in the middle, where it spends its time. And you see that it actually does something on uh, methods I implemented, that's PySDC something. And then there are system things like the MPI init thread, which takes quite a while. And the MPI for Py FFT and the broadcast and import lib. I don't care, right? 
On the bottom, you see what each thread is doing. Here, we're only doing four parallel time steps, no, uh, no parallelization in space. I have no filters. This is no custom color coding. I wouldn't, sorry, I wouldn't say this is helpful. So what you then could do, and that's the easiest thing to do uh, uh, with, with the framework we have, is you go into a Python code and define regions and say, well, this is my fine sweep. This is my coarse sweep. This is my, uh, this is my um, uh, interpolation restriction. And then let this thing uh, show up in your vampire. This is how it looks like at the end. And now I have used pintified colors, which really confuses the developers of this because they tend to have red as waiting time for MPI, but anyway. But now what you, I hope what you can see is that here in the middle, it actually says, okay, that's the fine sweep on uh, the zeros, the first, the second, and the third rank. Then there is the blue things, that's the one on the cost level. Then there's some, uh, there's residual and these kind of things. And you, on the bottom, if you transpose this, that's actually the communication scheme you were, I was expecting to see from PySDC. Well, there's one weird thing here going on and that actually kept us curious. So there's this silverish line that says MPI receive. And you can see that these things are spread at least in the last rank. So the last rank is actually waiting for quite a while. And that shouldn't happen. I mean, there's no good reason in theory that it should happen. Well, let's make a zoom into it. Okay, so this is thread zero is the first one. That's the second, third, and fourth. And you see that, okay, here's everything is great. You see the communication arrows, which shows you, okay, I'm sending this forward, I'm sending this forward, that's good. This is the sequential part, this blue font, that, that's fine. But here on the, the last thread, it actually waits and it waits until the previous uh, thread is done com uh, computing. So there is no overlap in communication computation, which is not what you want in this case. It actually is the case that the, the third thread sends data forward with an I send and then immediately goes into the, uh, the computation. And then it goes into the I send again. And then it said, oh, wait, there was something else in my pipeline. I have to send that actually. That's not what you want. The reason for that is that MPI standard does not guarantee progress of MPI unless you're within an MPI call, which is not happening within this red uh, plot. So that's nasty. So what can you do? Well, you can rewrite the whole code or you happen to have a uh, better MPI implementation which does that for you, for example, with a communication thread or something like this. And then all of these uh, silverish regions go away and it actually shows exactly the communication structure I have showed you before. And um, we'll see later that it actually helps you with the, uh, with the um, runtime of that thing. So, with the right MPI implementation, which does that for you, you can actually uh, get the overlap, but you have to be sure that you actually do get the overlap and these tools can actually help you to do that. I was not prepared to see that, to be honest. Okay, so that's pretty much looked like the idealized diagram we made by hand. So that's enough for me for that part. So now there's a the more automatic way of doing that. And there's a jupe, um, sorry, the cube, um, uh, toolbox and there's a lot of numbers, but I want just to uh, uh, to focus on these highlighted things. And you see that there's a, a severe load imbalance. You see that the uh, first fine sweep takes 0 0.34 seconds, and the last one below here takes 0 0.47 seconds. That's the severe imbalance. And you can see that on the right as well. Rank zero takes that amount. Rank three takes that amount. That's not what you want. And you can see that the average visit time, which is roughly corresponding to your runtime on that region, is nearly 10 seconds. So let's change the MPI implementation. And it goes, goes down from 10 seconds to 8 seconds, and the load balance goes away. So that's pretty decent. Um, Cube would show this load balance for you. You don't have to find it yourself. It would not suggest what to do about it. For that, you kind of need people to talk to. Um, okay, so these are my lessons I learned. Um, just because I wrote the code and I think it, I know what it does, doesn't mean it actually does that. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is I could have looked into my own timings output and there's a lot of timings output onto PySTC if you want. Uh, and I would have to know what to look for, but the question is why would I? I have these tools and they tool, these tools can do that for me. So 
we found that issue there and we found a few other issues there, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. And I just presented only a brief part of what we did. And uh, there's a lot of things to learn about this. The drawback here is, and I, I keep mentioning this, is initial setup and usage is actually pretty hard. So the, the idea here is, and that's what they actively uh, advertise, you have to talk to the developers. And one way to do that is attend the workshops online or sometimes maybe in person or uh, apply at services like POP um, to start uh, doing your analysis. They help you with this. They can even look into your code and do uh, and go ahead. Okay, so three takeaways. Uh, well, if you were interested in STC and FAST, PySTC would be one way to go. That's at least the idea of this code. Then if you want to dig deeper into your own parallel time or parallel space code for that matters, performance tools can help you to identify bottlenecks, even bugs, or just propose optimization opportunities. The thing is, it can be quite frustrating, I can tell you that, to start with this. So the idea is use the support infrastructure to avoid this frustration at the beginning. That's all from my side. Thank you.